Kimberly, the problem is I'm not sure the world needs another sports bra. The truth is you're a nothing burger in this market. Nothing. You have nothing. And $125,000 isn't going to get you anything. You need huge marketing dollars to make that brand even mean anything. That's the problem. You know that. You know what I think? I think you know you're dead. This is over. Now, you came here to hear the truth. I just gave it to you. But I cannot put my money in harm's way here. There is no hope. You're going to zero with this. I'm not. That was Kevin O'Leary, also known as Mr. Wonderful on the reality TV show Shark Tank. And love or hate his brush style, he certainly is a wonderful businessman and investor. O'Leary is a self-made multimillionaire with an estimated net worth of around $400 million. And like the entrepreneurs that appear on Shark Tank, O'Leary started with a big vision but small funds. He launched an educational software company from his basement, which he eventually sold to toy giant Mattel for $3.7 billion. It was one of the largest deals ever in the consumer software industry. O'Leary has since founded his own mutual funds company and has invested in dozens of ventures. And it seems Mr. Wonderful may be inspired by another outspoken businessman, Donald Trump. Montreal-born O'Leary may be considering a run to lead Canada's Conservative Party. Well, our Patrice Howard met with a TV personality and tycoon, and she started by asking him how investors can find opportunity in this uncertain, seemingly unstable market. The price of oil has gone from $120 down to below $30, reduced our energy costs by 70%, and yet the market is looking, that, looking at that as a sign that we're slowing, their economy is slowing. Over the next few quarters, I'm going to invest in all the other sectors, all the other nine sectors of the economy, not energy, because I don't know how low oil is going to fall, but I'm going to get the benefit at some point of the lowest input cost for energy in two generations. And so I predict earnings will be actually quite good, cash flows will be quite good come Q4, and I'll be rewarded for buying those stocks now. You have to stomach the volatility, you have to believe in the thesis, but if you could give me a world with no energy costs, I would love that world. They say when China sneezes, the world catches a cold. Obviously, we've seen sort of the results of the Chinese markets being down and the, the growth there being slow, but you have remained bullish on uh, Chinese equities. Talk about that. No matter if you take the most pessimistic growth scenario for the next three years, it's still a hundred time larger, hundred times larger than what we have here stateside. And so for me to have no exposure to Asia is a huge investment mistake in my view. Because if you think about where the world growth is, you've got this massive middle class emerging into the Chinese economy. So it's moving away from just a manufacturing ex export economy to one of servicing a middle class. This is like getting an opportunity to invest in America a hundred years ago. And that was a very good call if you were smart enough to do that. I'm doing the same thing in the Asian market. When you're not running your own business, you're helping other people run their businesses. I like to think so. What are some of the biggest mistakes those entrepreneurs make when they finally get a seat in front of a shark like yourself? Very often the biggest mistake is they overvalue their business or their idea. And they ask for a valuation that's ridiculous particularly ones that have practically no sales or no sales track record because from sales all good things flow. If you can't make a profit in 36 months, it's just a hobby. It's not a business. You have to take it behind the barn and shoot it. Many of the companies that come to you are in their startup phase and of course it's been uh, sort of a growing trend that we've seen uh, larger valuations for these startups, especially in Silicon Valley, almost to the point that we're seeing a bubble. Is there investment opportunity there or is that a bubble that's going to burst? Many of these companies have sales, they have cash flow, they are profitable. It's just that they sold themselves while they were private at valuations that are not sustainable in the public markets. That's what's great about being public. It's price discovery every second. In a private situation, there's more opportunity to manipulate the valuation. And I don't think Uber is worth $70 billion. And I don't think if it goes public tomorrow morning, it's going to get a $70 billion valuation. That means the people that paid more than call it 30 or 40 billion are going to lose half their money. I would never touch that investment, yet I use the service every day.
in looking at companies that are right now are sort of on the verge of going public, are, are there any that you are eyeing that you think should be in the public sphere? I'm an extremely conservative investor. You can't get me excited about something that hasn't had a chance to prove itself on the market first. And if you look at many of these tech deals, and I brought up one like GoPro, people have lost 78% of their money there. Twitter. You're under the IPO price. Why? The company does not pay a dividend, yet I use the service every day. I can love a product or service. I don't love the stock, particularly if it doesn't have a long track record of, track record of stability and dividend growth. In the end, investing is about getting your money back. Now let's talk politics. Obviously election season is heating up here in America and running a political campaign is in many ways like running a business. You need a strong strategy. Uh, you need voter or user acquisition. You have been compared in some circles to Donald Trump. You have a no-nonsense approach to business. Do you think that his business skills will translate well to the presidency? I think they do because there's a tonality in America that says we want results. As a talent in politics, that's what's missing right now. You've got such a divisive, you know, breakup in the parties that nobody can work together anymore. And I think, you know, in the case of Trump, you may not like his style, but I think there's a lot of people starting to think maybe this is the right way to actually build over the next four years because we need to get the, the, these extremes thinking back together again. I've also seen over the last eight years that we've vilified Wall Street. We've taken the backbone of what makes, makes America great, entrepreneurialism, and made it a bad thing. We need new leadership to get us back to the center. We're way, way, way off to the left now. 